Hello, welcome. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes here. Thank you for joining today. Okay, in light of keeping on time today, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the attendees and to the faculty. My name is Tammy Rosenthal and I'm the Chief Perfusionist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I'll be moderating the discussion today with my co-moderator, Bill Riley, the Chief Perfusionist at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. In order to support perfusionists during this challenging time, as we're starting to see more and more COVID-19 patients in our hospitals and in our ICUs that are requiring escalated care, the representatives from AMSECT, the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion, the American Academy of Cardiovascular Perfusion, the Australian and New Zealand College of Perfusionists, Comprehensive Care Services, Michigan Society of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgeons, as well as Perfusion.com and Specialty Care, have formed the Perfusion COVID-19 Joint Task Force to monitor the recent coronavirus outbreak and its impact on our community. By combining the strengths of these organizations, our hope is to be able to disseminate information and help to try to resolve questions that come up related to perfusionists and COVID-19. Today, we have four faculty from New York and Seattle, Washington, who will each present on their experience with COVID-19 patients. We'll then have time for a Q&A session. We will be recording today's broadcast to allow for future playbacks. So please feel free to use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the middle of your Zoom screen, your presentation window, to submit any questions you may have during the presentation, and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible during the Q&A session. I'd now like to turn things over to Bill Riley, my co-moderator, to introduce our faculty. Thank you, Tammy, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I'd like to introduce our four presenters um, now, and then they'll all go um, in order. So uh, we have uh, Nick Mellis uh, from Montefiore Medical Center in Bronx, Trang Bodke, uh, from the University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle, Ryan Kleinman from Swedish Hospital in Seattle, and Bill Dubois from New York Presbyterian in New York City. They'll each have about 10 minutes, as Tammy said, and we'll be back with you afterwards to answer any questions um, and help moderate. So, Nick, uh, take it away. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Tammy. Thanks for organizing this. Uh, so, Obviously, a stressful situation here in New York. Um, I wish I was here to talk to everybody about uh, cardiac surgery and about perfusion, but uh, unfortunately, that's just not how it is here. Uh, we stopped doing surgeries uh, three weeks ago, so no elective cases. Um, I'll get into a little bit about what we're experiencing. CDC has some great information for you and for your state. Um, and as you can see, it's highly affected. This uh, is a shot from a um, couple of weeks ago or a couple of days ago. Yeah, here's the situation now, and you can see how it escalates Monday um, 70,000 cases in the state and 40,000 in New York City. And uh, um, Wednesday and yesterday, 86,000 in the state and 73,000 in the city. Our institutional impact, we have 1,300 COVID uh, patients in eight different hospitals. We have 1,100 uh, associates out, uh, severe man 
power sh shortage. Um, so, you know, what I'm sharing today is something that uh, I think everyone should kind of um, be prepared for if it's going to go up and down 95, uh, I-95, it'll, it'll go everywhere um, as people retreat from the city. So um, our ECMOS experience is limited. Um, we've had two VV ECMOs so far. We're using the Crescent Canyon on both of them. Uh, these patients become very hypotensive on an initiation. We have not seen that before. That is not usually what happens with our patients. Um, a little bit of calcium and some vasopressin uh, generally uh, is going to help that. But you have to be careful with uh, really uh, bumping up the pressures on these patients because uh, we had one that herniated. Um, so uh, we had, you know, run the pressures up uh, and nothing excessive except they went from being very hypotensive to having uh, systolic blood pressures of 220 or more. So be careful with your pressors. All of our patients are um, anticoagulated. We have a lot of problems with, uh, with these patients and microvasculature. Um, average, average days on ventilator is uh, around 23. Um, I don't know about ECMO yet. I just, I'm not sure what's going on and how long these patients will be on. I don't, I don't think it matters if COVID doesn't come to you. This has been a reasonable exercise to know what we're not great at. And if, if it's not going to come to you, then you're lucky. Um, but you should still take the opportunity to learn from everybody on this um, presentation to educate yourselves. Um, I don't know, about a month ago, I guess we, uh, or a month and a half ago, we stocked up on our inventory. So uh, we're pretty well set with oxygenators, with ECMO pumps. Um, but like everybody else, we have, uh, we have run through a lot of what we have as far as PPE. Um, and, you know, so inventory is something that you should be looking at now if you're not already in the midst of this uh, and you should stock up. Um, I recommend that you understand, um, get to know your colleagues and not work in silos. Um, I was not uh, prepared enough to understand what my colleagues needed and how they worked, a lot of them. And, but I'm learning now because I'm doing some of their work. I'm taking direction from them and, and helping where we can. Um, when I talk about things that you're gonna need, you cannot even imagine. Um, you're gonna need ventilators. Uh, you're gonna need IV pumps uh, in different places, places where you've never used them. We're using our conference center um, to, to, uh, to take care of patients. Um, our cath labs, our ORs, we have uh, now um, 15 or so patients in our operating rooms. We are not doing elective surgeries, like I mentioned. Um, if you're gonna go into your OR, you might wanna think about your positive pressure room and make those OR uh, negative rooms, negative pressure rooms. Um, so, and that's what I mean about learning about your facilities, uh, getting to know your engineering folks. Um, you know, if you're, if some of your staff members have, uh, beards, they should shave them because the PPE doesn't work if you have, uh, you know, your, your uh, N95 masks don't work if you have a beard. Um, these are things that you need to be thinking about now and to, get yourself into a situation uh, like we have now and think you're going to learn this and be good at it right away. Uh, it's not going to happen. Um, you need to be practicing with PPE. You're going to need people to watch people don and doff. Um, you need to support your colleagues and your, and communicate with them. Um, this is no, this is no one's fault. Uh, it's not your hospital's fault that they're running short. Uh, January 26th, I think Dr. Fauci said that uh, 
he didn't think that this was going to be as bad as it uh, had been in China. And uh, no one can imagine if you're not here in New York um, and you have colleagues, call them and find out what they're doing. Um, because none of us could have imagined that uh, this would have, have affected us like this. Um, we have I've heard of some people that have gone to uh, newspapers and to press. Um, it's, it's just not helpful. You're not going to get anywhere with it. Uh, we'll get the equipment we need. Everybody will get it. Um, but uh, to complain about it now and put it out there in, uh, into the general press is uh, it, it um, people are scared enough and, and I don't, it's, not, it's not helpful. It's not going to get us anywhere. So um, you need to support your community here at the hospital, support uh, your, your friends that uh, are going through this um, and your colleagues at work. As I mentioned, get to know your engineering and your facilities, people, practice, uh, everything, you know, and, um, and your colleagues are going to need your help. So um, I'm doing a lot of different things. Yesterday I swept out uh, one of the ORs and, and I mopped it so we could get patients in to the OR. Uh, uh, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm taking direction from people that uh, used to ask me um, what we were going to do. And um, so it's an interesting time here. Uh, I would love to tell you all about how we're treating patients and, and how they are getting better, um, but it's not happening. Um, and that's what makes this so difficult. There's no magic uh, cure for this thing and everybody reacts differently. Uh, one of the things that we're thinking about right now is that uh, it, it could be the potential exposure that you have. The more time you're around these patients, the more time that you're in rooms, the, uh, the bigger the risk and, and possibly um, the bigger the effect. We had one, of our, uh, one of our staff had one exposure, went home, fever, cough, um, wound up on, on the good side of this. And uh, we had another uh, frontline person with um, multiple exposures over multiple days in PPE um, and did not do well um, and went down really hard, really fast. So everything, um, we're using everything Everything you hear about on the news, we're using it to treat people. And, um, you know, the best thing that we're experiencing right now is uh, conventional ventilation, uh, treating the ARDS uh, proning patients. And um, I'm not sure what else is going to work right now. <clears throat> the funny thing is about this is that everybody reacts differently. Um, and, you know, we just can't figure that out. There's no model for it. If you're 28, if you're 18, um, if you're 50, you know, people are coming in, they're on some oxygen, they get moved to a, uh, out of the unit, and then other people, you know, other uh, patients don't leave, uh, remain in the vent, and, uh, and sometimes don't come out, often don't come out. So... Look at that list um, and, uh, and disaster plan now. Don't wait until this thing comes down the road and winds up in your uh, small town or, or large city. Um, we have 15 people here, perfusion-wise, and it hit us really hard. If your institution has two, um, you need a plan to um, platoon yourself out. Um, I'm not sure that I, if I have two perfusionists in my institution that um, I would be one of the frontline people. You can support in other ways. Um, but that being said, in this institution, it is all hands on deck. Everybody is vital. Everybody is necessary. And um, that's because of the sheer volume that we have right now. 
All right, Nick, I'll, um, I'll stop you there. Sorry, um, we'll move on, but Nick will be here for questions uh, when the question and answer session starts. Uh, our next speaker is Trang Bodke. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Better. Thank you so much for inviting me to start this webinar. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about what we do here and how we're handling it at um, University of Washington Medical Center. First of all, I have no disclosures in the presentation. So a few things that I'm going to cover is um, safety, you know, healthcare workers, how we're conserving from surgical cases to staff, equipment, um, how some programs are on hold here, and then, of course, of interest to most of us right now is um, ECMO and how we select our patients, a little bit of the Kenny Lane process, staffing, and any other additional information. Um, for safety and PPE, I don't know if every hospital practices the fit testing, but we made it mandatory. It should be mandatory, um, like expressed before. There are so many different masks. People don't wear them properly. It's no use. Um, this is not the time to take shortcuts. It's not the time to just, you know, tie half a mask on, walk into an operating room and um, think that you are safe. You're doing this for yourself and everybody else in the room. So some people don't know how to use, you know, a papper. They don't know if they have the duckbill mask for them or an N95, which is why we fit test. Also in our facility, we have also I've done mandatory training on donning and doffing, um, two different trainings, one for the OR and one for the unit on the floor. How do we try to keep our healthcare workers safe? Every day we have a daily attestation now. Um, it's, if you see it on the screen, what you're reading is what you're saying you attest to that you don't come in with any of these symptoms. If you do come in with these symptoms, you are to be sent home. Um, this kind of was a little bit touchy and I know in some areas because some people might take advantage of the situation. They don't want to come to work. I stress, please do not do that. Your team needs need every manpower they can get to do this. Also, as you know, basic as it seems, hand hygiene, gel in, gel out, make sure you scrub with soap at least for 20 seconds. Some people don't know how long 20 seconds are. Sing a row, row, row your boat, or as my daughter says, happy birthday. Um, masking now, as of yesterday, is actually going to be given to all um, departments, um, clinics, units, the emergency department, people who are at the front door screening people coming in, and um, security as well. We have also um, not allowed any visitors, and the new one too as of yesterday was no more healthcare workers eating or drinking in patient care areas within six feet of another person either. So I guess, you know, your lunch buddies may be gone. Um, there's also designated units for COVID patients, but that may be changing too depending on the number of patients we have. So as far as conserving on surgical cases, we are supposed to be no longer doing elective cases. We do have specific rooms for COVID. Every patient that comes in now is being tested for COVID before we can operate on them. If they test positive, and of course, different PPEs, different rooms, um, if they haven't been tested, we still treat them as if they are positive. Um, that's for the emergency cases that you know, we do. We no longer um, have observers in the room and no medical students. And of course, we've had to adjust our daily staffing schedule. Um, so that way we can preserve our staff. So it used to be the first call person would call our schedule out. Now it's just one person to keep consistency. So that way we keep the call people out in case emergencies come in in the middle of the night. How are we saving um, and conserving on equipment is we have two systems for ECMO. One is our homegrown system, which we use with the central mag and an auctionary use of patient filling screen from bypass. The other one is our cardio help, which we use only for ECMO patients. I'll explain why a little bit later, why we do that. And of course, we only do BV ECMO here, 25 French Biomedic and Ephemeral, and 20 Femflex in the IJ. I'm starting to talk a little bit faster because you know, I'm running short on time. <laughs> um, programs we've put on hold here, we are no longer accepting cardiogenic shock patients um, or going out on ECMO transport. The reason for this is one, saving on PPEs, to staff, and we may not have the bed 
um, capacity at our hospital to take all these patients in. Of course, we no longer have in-house meetings. Everything is through Zoom, no cath conferences, no party morning conferences, round rounds, m and all through Zoom. So how do we select our patients? Basically, this is determined by the physician. Currently, it's the attending physician on the um, cardiogenic shock team. It needs approval by our director of ECMO, and also it is a team approach. What I mean by team approach is our indications and contraindications for ECMO um, for COVID patients was worked by with Swedish Hospital here in town, our facility, and hospitals in um, Portland. Um, we came up with the following, and this was updated as of last night. The indications, as you can see, I'm not going to read them all um, on why you know we would put a patient on ECMO and accept them. And then this is a busy slide, contraindications, you know, for morbidities, age over 60, prolonged ventilation, um, acute liver failure, any of those things. And also of note to make it really important is point number nine there on my slide, which is we will not um, offer eCPR for COVID patients associated, associated with cardiac arrest. So some relative contraindications to keep in mind for the future, or it could be possibly soon, is that um, obesity, immunocompromised, or um, we just don't have the capacity to take them in. Um, so how do we cannulate on VV ECMO? So VV ECMO is, um, like I said before, 20 from flex, cannulation is um, bedside. How we do this is we prime a circuit outside the room. We um, have the perfusionist walk and talk to the cannulating um, through the cannulating process with the specialist and with the cannulating physician. We do this because perfusionist does not go into the room to cannulate. So we've got to make sure they know what they're doing and they're comfortable with it. And only the cannulating physician specialist into the room. Um, this is to one, prevent entering, going in and out of the room multiple times. Again, saving PPR, saving staff. Um, ECMO, um, ECMO COVID patient protocol. So our staffing right now goes as follows is once we're cannulated the attending physician will um, deem the patient stable if the specialist does not need anything then the call perfusionist can um, cover from home and back the team off um, back the team off the unit or from home with a callback time of 30 minutes um, a perfusionist is always available in-house at the facility there from seven to three but usually we're there later to the cases so before the last perfusionist leaves, they will check on the floor and the ECMO specialist if they need anything. Our ECMO specialist, usually either an RT and RN, we try to go with an RN first, so that way they can manage the patient, adjust any vents. And of course, the specialists do work, work in shifts. So some additional information here um, is that we use the cardio help, like I said before, for these specific patients because they have um, alarms on them, whereas our homegrown circuit does not, that we're receiving on um, equipment. This helps the specialist out in that they can manage more than one patient at a time. Also, um, like I said, our COVID patients are considered DNR, so we will not switch a patient from VV to VA or VAV ECMO, but if the oxygen area does clot out or be chained out, then we will do that. We always have one reserved set of party health as a backup um, outside of the patient's room on the unit. And then something to take into consideration is cleaning protocols that, you know, usually we're just cleaning it ourselves. Now there's actually a two hour wait for anyone to enter the room, it has to be a specific person. They will clean it all with bleach. The equipment gets removed into an ante room. It'll get cleaned again with bleach and then it'll get brought up to us, the perfusionist, and we will clean it in the perfusion room. So, in conclusion, my most important thing out of all of this is definitely know how to use PPE properly and understand it. Safety is so important. Have a game plan in place with a backup plan. Have backup supplies, know how your staff is doing, if you need to have travelers, um, anything like that. Know the limits of your staff. They cannot be stressed and overworked. And also, big, big, big thing is communication and being flexible and always being able to move with what is happening, you know, with the virus and changing and adapting. Like I said, part of this slide presentation, I ended up changing last night because there were so many updates. And that was done because of communication. So I cannot stress that enough. Thank you.
Um, thanks, Jan. I, I apologize, but your slides were not showing. We didn't want to interrupt your presentation. Um, but we will post those to this, the discussion board um, immediately following. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay, next I'd like to hand things off to Ryan Kleinman. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. You guys can hear me? Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> So uh, first of all, I'd like to um, just thank everyone who's joining here uh, because I kind of feel a collaboration here. None of us are experts in this yet. And I appreciate everybody who's joining and we will, are gonna welcome <clears throat> suggestions and fixes and hopefully our collective um, intelligence and you know work hardiness will be able to help us um, improve our systems. But uh, as of now, we'll give you basically what we, what we have now. So um, I'm just gonna go through what um, we um, have experienced at Swedish in Seattle and some of the changes we've made to our normal VV ECMO system. Number one is that we assume that all patients are COVID positive unless proven otherwise. And so if we have a patient, like last night we had a dissection patient that came in straight from the ER. So we all did uh, donning of proper PPE. And uh, we did donning of proper PPE just in the OR. So everybody wore an N95 mask, everybody donned appropriately. Secondly, um, if we have a, all of the patients we've done uh, VV ECMO on so far have been transfer patients from other hospitals who were declining and um, were transferred to our center. So um, we, to uh, minimize the exposure to the staff, we cannulated these patients directly in the ICU. Um, that was one of the steps that was important to our surgical team. And so that kind of dictated um, how, we, um, how we ran our system. So um, first of all, we have limited number of people in the room. So the perfusionist at our center is in the room just in case something goes wrong with the circuit and also to help out with the surgical um, items because we have one scrub nurse, the surgeon, and uh, a radiology tech to run the C arm uh, for a position of the cannulas, and then an ICU nurse who's going to sit at the head of the bed to do the basically the anesthesia as under directed by the surgeon. So these patients were sedated. Our first patient that we put on, um, and this is in uh, in process of publication, but, um, and I've been cleared to share uh, his story. So he was a 44 year old um, ER doctor from uh, a hospital that was receiving a lot of the patients that were coming from that initial wave of deaths coming from the life care center in uh, Kirkland. And so he was exposed many times and got sick and decompensated and uh, he tested negative his first uh, trip to the ER. He went, they sent him home, he decompensated, he came back to the ER, then he tested positive. Um, and then he was placed on a nasal cannula at three liters. And then within 24 hours, he was intubated and prone and decompensating. And uh, he showed signs of, uh, which, um, kind of Nick mentioned of uh, some kind of cardiomyopathy stuff happening with these patients to get some viral overload. And we've heard this from um, Asia and Europe and across the world that this kind of uh, viral load has implications in other organs too. So you can get mods with these kind of patients. So um, he was transferred to us in that state and um, we, Took him directly to the ICU. Like I said, we cannulated him VV ECMO. We did FemFem VV because uh, we wanted to reduce the risk of aerosolization needed for the uh, placement of the neck cannula. 
um, that Nick mentioned, the Crescent. So um, we did FemFem VV using um, Medtronic cannulas, uh, but uh, you can use whatever you got, obviously. Um, and I'm not, we're not also, we, we haven't figured out what the best scenario is for this. Obviously the, the least, the, the quickest way to do it is um, through the one cannula in the neck instead of two cannulas in the groin. Um, but um, so far this has been a good practice for us. Uh, back to the gentleman. Uh, so he spent a week on VV ECMO. They had a, um, they tried a new regimen of uh, drugs that the world is talking about, uh, hydroxychloroquine and, you know, tocilizumab, however you say that drug. <laughs> um, and uh, he didn't qualify for remdesivir because uh, when he got to us, his uh, kidneys were um, uh, on the fritz. So we, he didn't qualify for that. So it's uh, um, cleared by the kidneys. So um, we cannulated uh, VV. He spent seven days. Uh, after the uh, IL-6 inhibitor, his, um, his C-reactive protein dropped pretty dramatically. I've, we've heard from other presenters around the world that, that selective IL-6 inhibitors aren't necessarily, you know, the magic bullet and nothing is, but we found for him this helped. And um, he slowly was uh, weaned down to 21% on his FIO2, his PAO, PAO2, FIO2 um, ratio went from the 80s to 104 after the first day. Um, his FIO2 requirement was like 100% and peep of, 20 is the first when we first got him <clears throat> and it was on day four his pao2 fio2 ratio was in the in the hundreds and uh let's see here his biventricular function got uh markedly better c-reactive protein uh dropped and uh he was eventually weaned off of ecmo on day seven and um, weaned off of the ventilator on day 10, I believe. So that, that patient's currently um, isolated in a COVID unit, specialized unit in our, um, in one of the ICUs that we've made into a kind of a COVID wing. We went back and forth. I've heard discussions about the negative and positive room. And uh, we went back and forth on that. We decided for, for surgical procedures that are in the OR that we would keep it positive pressure because of the, the risk of infection was higher than the risk of contamination. Um, I don't know, that's just where they're at on that. Um, but in the, in the ICU, which is where we've done all of them, it's negative pressure. So I guess it's kind of a moot point. Um, we cut CRRT uh, connectors into each of the circuits for these COVID patients in case they need um, CRRT and to help possibly sieve off the cytokines and uh, that the heavy viral load can cause kidneys to fail. So, um, which is more likely than in normal VV cases. Um, we also seriously considered uh, potential to transfer from VV to VAV. Um, because of the need of underlying heart conditions. So I would say if your hospital is receiving a patient or, or going to cannulate for VV ECMO, that you, um, that you dive deep into what their, uh, the potential of having cardiac failure as well from, <clears throat> even if they don't have previous uh, cardiac uh, disease, um, it's good to check their current status because it may have changed uh, pro tip about cannulating in the uh, ICU room, since it's isolated and there's only a certain amount of people, there's no in and out during the, during the procedure. Just only take in what you need. Otherwise, you have to get rid of the stuff you don't need and you have to clean extra things that you didn't use. So I learned that's the hard way the first time. 
So um, also we have ECMO specialists that are trained and retrained quarterly on emergency interventions. So we don't keep the ECMO circuit outside the room, we keep it inside the room so that every hour they have to do um, vitals anyway. So if there was an emergency, they'd be equipped to be able to handle an oxygenator change out or de-airing or, or changing out a module or something like that. So, I mean, we've got, we got other little tips and tricks, but um, I want to respect the time of this, of this panel. I thank you guys so much for allowing this opportunity. Thank you very much, Ryan. Appreciate it. Uh, our next presenter is Bill Dubois from New York Presbyterian, New York City. Bill. Hey, hey good morning, everybody. Thanks uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, like Nick uh, from New York City, we have about 1,300 patients as well. About 25, 30% of those are on in the ICU, and just about every ICU patient is on a ventilator. Uh, our experience with ECMO is quite limited. We had a big run to uh, build up our ECMO support service. Uh, New York Presbyterian in total probably does about 300 ECMOs a year. Currently COVID patients, I believe it's uh, five or less. So uh, not much of a need for ECMO that we've seen here. Uh, the prone therapy on ventilator support seems to be helping. Um, typically when they're over 12 days, uh, that's when we see all the uh, negative effects. Um, we see this thing, uh, cytokine storm, and what the results of that are uh, multi-organ failure, um, myocarditis, um, and kidney failure. So like a few of the panels have said, uh, CRRT therapy or um, CVVHD. So as advice to programs that haven't seen much yet, I would uh, learn or get involved in how to operate these machines. See, there's some of the new roles we're seeing for perfusionists is operating that equipment. Um, as well, uh, some have mentioned, are there any out of state travelers? The government is uh, developing new exemptions. And I might, I could foresee an exemption with perfusionists. They are licensed, uh, in treating patients, uh, delivering medications. I could see them getting involved in some of the ICUs uh, assisting the nurses. Um, the nurses have really been stretched. We've probably developed over 300 new beds in our hospitals. Um, and one of the alarm things we'll see, I don't know what was mentioned, our operating rooms. Currently about 80% of the rooms have now been converted to ICUs. So some of our oper operating rooms have two to three patients in each room. We have one core of uh, five rooms just in one hospital, but about 20% of the ORs uh, are now used only for surgery. Um, and about 20% of those rooms have been converted for COVID patient surgery. Uh, they typically are negative pressure. So they're actually building these rooms as we uh, speak. Uh, a big thing, I guess hasn't, I guess it's all been touched about the um, perfusion uh, therapy, ECMO and that. Some of the things, I guess the most important point I would bring up is uh, safety for yourself, uh, family and friends. Number one thing to do is no hands to the face. And I'll, I can you repeat that many times. That's what we've been uh, working on. No hands to the face, it's actually a difficult thing to do. And they're saying with the masks, uh, Although the masks may not, it's debatable whether it's airborne or droplet, the masks actually help prevent the hands touching the face, uh, as well as gloves. Typically, when you have gloves on your hands, you won't touch your face. So I would uh, practice that. Um, and conservation is another piece. Uh, conserving masks is big. Uh, gloves, there's been talk about in the room. You can Purell gloves and change, instead of changing them every time you touch a surface. It was mentioned, uh, just take what you need, whether setting up an ECMO in an ICU room, uh, typically two people would be involved handing equipment to those in the room. But even during procedures, uh, limiting the amount of supplies you take out of your perfusion cart, you do not want to be putting anything back in the cart. I mean, that's what we should be doing all the time. Uh, safety, I don't know if I mentioned, no hands to the face. 
I'll say that multiple times. Gloves and masks help prevent this. Purell every time you touch a surface. Um, some of the other safety measures we've taken uh, as we've gotten involved with CRRT, there is uh, some uh, steps you can take. You can extend the lines on the CRRT on all the COVID patients. We're trying to keep all the equipment outside of the room. So you'll see all the medication pumps are outside of the room. So the lines are extended. That probably can be done on the CRRT devices as well. Um, how we started, we did start with a big focus on ECMO, but again, we haven't seen all that much. It's big, the psychology of this disease, the anxiety on your teams, you have to make them feel that everything is possible being done. And uh, we do do that. The masks, although you don't need N95 masks for every situation, uh, only when you're working with these patients. But, uh, it's also been initiated at our hospital system. Everybody has masks on throughout the hospital, whether you're a frontline employee or not. And again, this helps prevent hands to the face. Um, oh, our conversions, we talked about that. Uh, new roles for perfusionists. Uh, I'd be proactive in that. I know there are some states that say we have poor patients in their whole system. I believe it will be coming to you. Uh, so what you can do is prepare, have some ECMO equipment available, uh, des describe new roles for perfusionists. Actually, in some hospitals, they actually uh, not re in deploying them, they're actually unemploying some of them, reducing their hours. I think the more active you can get, the more you can actually help and help make a difference. So CRT, learn that process, learn other ways to assist the nurses, uh, you may get involved in some of the uh, command center rooms for supply chain management, get involved with that. Uh, so what are some of the positive things we may be seeing? Um, this will probably change us forever how we practice our, uh, how we do our practice. Some uh, are coming up with ideas of the convalescent plasma therapy that individuals have gotten through the disease and the exposure uh, developed immunity, immunity, they may be able to offer their plasma, um, and that's been uh, looked at. And another thing is this herd immunity they've discussed in uh, Asia, where instead of keeping people distance, they're trying to, I guess, softly develop immunity, and whether that could help as they uh, try to flatten this curve. But it's a big deal in the Northeast. I believe no, New York and New Jersey, I think it's over 90,000 cases. It's uh, about half of the entire country here. Uh, mortality is uh, hovering around one to 2%. And at least in our institution, they're saying the, uh, the big wave is about to hit uh, this weekend or within the next week. Um, there are some other positives. The amount of patients actually being discharged is increasing, which is good to see. And the uh, and some uh, sites we're seeing the amount of admissions is uh, decreasing, hopefully as the curve flattens. What have we seen that's quite interesting? Um, very few emergencies. Um, we're a big aortic center and typically uh, four or five emergencies per week. And, the last two weeks, we've only had two. In the cardiac cath labs uh, for STEMIs, emergency stenting, typically we see 10 a week. We, we have seen very few, one or two per week, which is interesting. So in closing, uh, think of new opportunities of how you can be involved, uh, insisting in other areas, like Nick said, people that may have been uh, asking you for advice, you will probably be helping them now do their jobs. Uh, new roles, and then again, hands to face. This is a very powerful uh, yet simple uh, process to do. And the mask and the gloves uh, can help that. And I believe that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Bill, appreciate it. Um, it sounds like Bill picked off quite a few of the um, questions coming through. Um, 
I'd like to speak to um, a few things from our experience here at Mass General. Um, one, one word of advice that I've given out quite a bit the last couple of weeks is um, every institution has very current mandates and guidelines to follow. I know ours change daily now. They were changing by the hour for about a week. Now they're about daily. So I recommend no matter what we talk about on this webinar, um, go back to your institution and um, I'm sure that it's available. Find um, any kind of guidelines and mandates that come out before doing anything. Because it doesn't matter what we say on this webinar, it's what they're doing at your institution that you should really abide by. Um, and if anyone finds anything very interesting, please put it on the discussion board uh, relative to this topic. Um, a few people asked about um, why not to use dual lumen VV cannula. For us, it's about bedside cannulation. Uh, we typically use fluoro to do our, our dual lumen VVs and uh, doing uh, fem IJ is what we're doing. Uh, we're able to do that without fluoro in the room, which streamlines it, minimizes exposures. Uh, we, we did put one patient on uh, VA for a myocarditis, uh, but that was one. And that's kind of the limiting factor to all this. Uh, no one has an N of 50 or greater yet. So I think as we go, we're gonna develop a little bit more of a practice guidelines and a consensus. But right now, everyone is um, kind of doing their own thing. Uh, we are doing transplants here. We are considering transplants um, urgent slash emergent cases uh, here at Mass General. Um, we do liver, lung, and uh, heart. So um, one more. Uh, the PAPR, um, if, if you don't qualify for a 95 mask and um, they say you can use a PAPR device, which is kind of like a spacesuit, uh, we found out uh, in short order the hard way that it's very difficult to hear when you're wearing one of those. Um, there's air rushing around your ears, and if you're trying to run a heart-lung machine and, and wear a PAPR device, um, you may want to try one before trying to do that and getting stuck because it was very, very difficult to communicate with the perfusionist wearing that PAPR uh, for the case they were in. So uh, that's all I have. I'd like to open um, this up to the other panelists and Tammy um, to maybe uh, speak up a little bit and uh, go into some questions and answers. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Bill. So we've gotten a, a large amount of questions. Just wanted to start out, and I think um, any of the panelists could answer this. Um, how are the patients responding to ECMO therapy? And if we could talk about proning and um, trying to avoid clot with the CVVH. Anyone want to jump in? The, um, the proning seems to work well. Um, <clears throat> and I think some of the reasons for the ECMO is, or the avoidance of ECMO has been the not so great results we've seen, the number of, the amount of resources required for ECMO and the potential risk to uh, staff. I mean, this is kind of like war uh, mentality now that we have to preserve the people that can take care of the people that uh, have a reasonable chance of surviving. Uh, the CVVH, we are seeing those clot a lot and there is a big risk of DIC in these patients. Um, and they required a lot of change outs. Um, we've seen that on ECMO before, but it seems like it's just as bad on an unheparinized ECMO patient as it is with these uh, CRT patients. I can chime in here. So um, I think the key with doing ECMO on these patients is your patient selection, as with all ECMO patients, right? So um, I think that uh, making sure that they're young and healthy enough to handle the therapy and uh, intervening earlier than you normally would because of the rapid unforeseen progression of the disease. And so um, we've, we've only done two, but they've both been really, I mean, the second one's still on, but she's had a lot of um, improvement over the last uh three days, so, um, and the first one's off and um, fully functioning now and, and just waiting to get cleared to go back. So I think if you select the correct, and, and we've um, opted not to do ECMO on many several patients because of those things, but I think if you select the correct patient, it is the correct therapy for some patients. I mean, our average age is like 40 for ECMO. So these are young people that um, we're hoping is a short run. We haven't seen the clotting stuff. I mean, we have an N of two, so 
I mean, you don't, I don't really know what, uh, but um, we, we've just been treating them as individuals. And if they seem to be, you know, we're just looking at their blood. We have hematology um, linked into these and oncology for the, uh, for the drugs that are um, experimental. So, but, um, but hematology is in these cases and looking at it. And so they're kind of dictating that. So maybe that's an important thing to know is that you should have a hematologist involved uh, because they do get some kind of tricky inflammatory blood response. Okay, great. And another uh, ECMO related question is, are you, should you scavenge when and how for your ECMO and or bypass cases if you have any of those? So we are, we're scavenging and we're scavenging to uh, the discard in the ICU. Um, and we do it just like we would uh, scavenge medical gas on bypass um, connected to the outlet, uh, exhaust outlet with a couple holes so we don't occlude it. Uh, and very low vacuum, it's uh, like minus 18. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what we're doing here. Um, proning seems to help, but uh, also um, we're, we only have an N of two and one was only on for a day. Uh, we're day four with our other 54 year old patients. So uh, I'll post on the discussion board and let anybody know if we're having any difficulties, but that's where we're at right now. Hey, uh, Nick, uh, question. Have you um, tested the um, effluent that comes out of the oxygenator on the scavenger? I don't know if you have a collection chamber. Some have discussed the collection chamber because there's a lot of condensation. Yeah, we don't have a vapor trap. Um, okay. I know that some of uh, some of your colleagues might, and um, you know, we talked about, uh, and I think that uh, one of my guys might have sent a note over to you guys to see if you were testing, but uh, I hadn't heard back yet. So we have not, but I was interested to see if um, you know if we were going to get a positive result. But uh, we didn't put a collection chamber in yet. Yeah, we. We've added it to some, uh, one of the circuits and not to another. There is a lot of condensation that comes out. I believe it's condensation, the warm patient blood and cold gas. The, some of people argue against it because these oxygenators are considered non-microporous. So I don't know if that's an issue, <clears throat> but um, the heat exchangers uh, are not, and I know fluid has gone or methylene blue has gone through the heat exchangers. So I don't know if it's reversed the other way that maybe some of that stuff you're pulling out could be contaminated. So we don't know, but I think it's a, a good precaution. Um, it does show the staff you've taken every step possible. Um, and you gotta be careful cleaning it if you do have the traps. Right. So Greg Maddy just posted um, a minute ago that there's a report out of Japan on LinkedIn today. Uh, they got a positive PCR from an ECMO sweep gas exhaust on a membrane uh, oh. with a PMP membrane. So food for thought. It's breaking news. I have um, two questions re related to cytokines. Has anyone considered having a hemoconcentrator on the circuit and continuously Z buff to reduce the IL-6 and the cytokines, and also a few questions about the cytokine absorbing filters. Um, does anyone have access to those? Well, I think that uh, the way that we do that instead of using hemoconcentrator is CRRT, because you can do multiple things at once. You're not just hemoconcentrated. You can also re keep their, you can also replace, and you know, you can do a lot more with the CRRT than you can with the hemoconcentrator. And so, and yeah, they have available the cytokine absorbing filters. Um, another question, I know, I think Bill had a commentary about this earlier, was if you want to speak to the vent splitting and if, if that's been successful in any of your institutions. So we are, we are not doing that right now. All of our patients that are in the OR have uh, their own individual vent. Bill, have you done that at all? Um, one of the campuses has uh, looked at that um, and we were waiting to see how it worked. Uh, is a, the, um, I guess setting that up, it's pretty complicated. Patients have to be matched for size, uh, lung volume, uh, lung compliance and such. 
So, and then there's also the filtration uh, aspects of it. Uh, more filters are needed. Inlet and outlet uh, filters on the airway tubing. So, uh, no, I, I have no personal experience in that. And then there was some question about any patients, positive patients for bypass. Um, and then questions circulating around, are you testing your patients before they do, if they are going to have a bypass procedure? Um, well, we've had two where we thought were positive, and actually on one of them, the results came during the case that they were negative, but all precautions we're taking. Uh, we recommend only staff who needs to be in the room during intubation, during the possible aerosolization, uh, be in there. Everyone had N95 masks, because there is a risk. We've had cases where the uh, tube, ET tube comes out, or it's disconnected during it, so as a kind of a universal precaution, you need to assume that those things can happen, especially for the frontline staff. Yeah, our, our patients um, are tested for the command of the word, then no. You want to, will you repeat that, Trang? You're just breaking up a little bit. I think we have you on mute, if you want to unmute. I think the reception on the beach isn't too good. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was there. Our, um, at the university here, we test every patient that comes through, but if it's an emergency, it's like a dissection or something in the middle of the night, then we'll just treat them as they're COVID. Great. So um, I, I want to um, just clarify what I said. Um, I wasn't, I, my, my mouth worked faster than my eyes. Um, uh, the, the, the exhaust plasma during a plasma leak from an ECMO circuit tested positive. The clear fluids did not. But um, I think, um, you know, with, with the uh, penalty for failure here is pretty high. I, don't, I, I think I'm going to push my ECMO team as soon as we're done with this webinar to start scavenging our gases up in the ICU. So um, we're going to um, cut the question and answer. Um, session here, I think. And um, uh, what I recommend is anyone that didn't get their, their question answered or wants to continue, um, there is a discussion board um, on the um, on the COVID-19 task force website. Um, it's uh, www.jointperfusiontaskforce.org. I don't know if there's a way to get that up on the screen for people to see it um, so they can write it down. Um, but um, there are lots of materials on there if you're not already familiar with it. And there's also a great document that goes over licensing and staffing um, information by state. Um, I found out through that document that in Massachusetts, they loosened up licensure regulations. I had no idea. And I'm two doors away from the licensing office. Um, so um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank our panel very much for, for participating here and all of our all of our participants, uh, thank you for taking the time. This obviously affects all of us. We're all in this together. Um, there will be a YouTube version of this webinar. Um, it's being recorded. Um, actually, the YouTube version was running simultaneously with a 20 second delay and that will be available immediately. Um, and then please stay tuned um, for information about our next webinar. I'm not sure if we know exactly when it's gonna be, but we'll reach out in a similar manner for how you got email correspondence about this webinar. So I'll turn it over to Tammy for the final uh, sign off, but thank you all very much and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Great, thanks Bill. Thanks to all our panelists and our attendees. Please send in your questions and we will try to incorporate them also in the next webinar tentatively next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye.